All righty. Well, it is just past one o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. I'm sure we'll see some more folks uh, coming through in a few minutes. But thank you so much for joining us, everybody, for this virtual mind walk. My name is Monica, and I'm with the Central Coast State Parks Association, or CSPA. And we're so excited to be able to have this awesome presentation from some state park environmental scientists today. Um, as you can see here on your screen, um, if you want to check out that website, centralcoastparks.org slash mindwalks, um, you can see a list of upcoming lectures as well as recordings of any past programs. Um, they're all amazing, super fascinating, and all relevant to our Central Coast. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge um, Thomas and Mary Catherine Eltsroth. They um, help underwrite the MindWalks program, so we want to say thank you to them. If you want to be a supporter of the MindWalks program or another state park program, you can check out the second link that you see on your screen, centralcoastparks.org slash friend, and you can become a friend of CSPA and help support um, awesome educational programs in our state parks. So I'm going to turn this off. Um, again, thank you for being here today. Um, just a couple things. Uh, as we hear our presentation today, if you have any questions that you think of, feel free to use the Q&A or chat feature at the bottom of your screen. So if you scroll down there, you should see either a chat box um, or a Q&A box. You can type your question there. We'll get to questions at the end of the presentation. Um, so if you think of it, feel free to write it in and we will get to it then. Um, I believe that's it for housekeeping. I'll go ahead and introduce our speakers. So this virtual mind walk um, is called Restoring Native Habitats on the Central Coast. And I'm thrilled to have um, these awesome guest speakers here today. Um, they're part of the environmental science team of the San Luis Obispo Coast District of California State Parks. So we have Jody Isaacs, Kelly Carlisle, and Molly Wilson joining us. Um, I'll start with introducing Jody. Jody has worked in the natural resource management field for over 30 years and currently works as an environmental scientist for California State Parks in Morro Bay, where she dedicates much of her time to habitat conservation and restoration. Over the years, Jody has worked to restore riparian, grassland, oak, woodland, and coastal scrub habitats through California. Thanks, Jody, for being here and all the awesome stuff you're doing. Um, Kelly Carlisle, um, after graduating UC Davis with a Bachelor of Science in Ecology, Evolution, and Biodiversity, Kelly is now an environmental science, or excuse me, environmental services intern for California State Parks in Morro Bay, focusing on invasive weeds and habitat restoration. Thank you, Kelly. And lastly, um, Molly Wilson. Molly is a graduate of Humboldt State University, holding a BS in environmental science and management. She has been working as an environmental services intern for the San Luis Obispo Coast District of California State Parks since May of 2021. Her background includes working within the fields of environmental education, interpretation, organic farming, and she is currently focused in the field of weeds and restoration. We're so excited to have you all here. Their team is currently focused on restoration projects at Montaña de Oro State Park and Moro, um, Moro Bay State Park which involves removing non-native species and collecting, propagating, and planting native, plant, or native species. When not restoring habitats, they're looking for new weeds, helping to monitor wildlife, and doing what it takes to protect our parks. Yay! All righty, I'm going to hand it off to Jody, and thank you again for being here, everyone. Thanks, Monica. Okay, I'm going to start by doing the share of the screen. Let's make sure, can, um, let's do this. Monica, can you hear me? Yep, you are good. And seeing your screen. How's that? Um, there we go. Sweet, oh. thank you. Okay, welcome everybody. We're so excited here today to share some of our two favorite projects that we've been working on. Basically, um, we have it split up where I'm gonna share um, a restoration project we've done at Morrow Strand. And we'll take um, one eye end. I can take a few questions there related to that project. And then Kelly and Molly are going to take it on and talk about a coastal bluff uh, project that we've been working on. Um, so that's kind of how it's going to run today. And we're super. And then other questions at the end of the presentation, if you have, we're more than happy to answer what we can um, and, and talk about restoration. So I'm going to just get started here. 
I always like to start with um, basically the park's mission. I mean, I'm hoping some of you are familiar with what we do at state parks. Um, but basically it's about preserving our biological diversity in our state and protecting these natural and cultural areas for people to enjoy and doing that through recreational activities for generations to come. So that's our big overall mission at parks. You know, and we're broken up into, into uh, I guess, divisions, if you will. Like we have, many of you are familiar with our rangers and our visitor services, um, the people at the kiosk. So there's a visitor services part of parks. There's the maintenance part of parks, you know, the ones that are taking care of all our facilities. There's our archeological and cultural staff. There's our interpreter staff that is interpreting these resources to the public. There's our planning staff. So there's lots of different areas of parks. We, um, Kelly, Molly and I are part of the natural resources part of parks. And we have kind of our own mission underneath the umbrella of state parks mission. And that is to restore, protect and maintain representative and outstanding examples of California natural resources. And I kind of like to simplify it. It's kind of like a library. I think of it as we are protecting a library of California's finest resources and allowing people to come and enjoy them, right? So we look at the state of California, we take those representative habitats that mean some, that represent California and protect and restore them for people to enjoy. So that's, that's kind of our, um, our overall mission that we try to accomplish every day or that we work under every day. Here, we work in San Luis Coast District. And for those of you, those of you that aren't familiar, it basically is, uh, stretches just south of the county line um, all the way down to Montana de Oro. We're considered a coastal unit, meaning the majority of our, our parks are in the coast in the coastal zone, unlike let's say Anza Borrego, which is in the desert, right? Uh, we're one of you know over 270 park units statewide, um, but our habitats here pretty much focus on dunes, coastal bluff, coastal scrub. We have riparian wetland, so we have a variety of and even Monterey pine forest. So we have a variety of habitats, but it is just along that coastal that coastal zone. We feel really fortunate to work in this zone because it's so beautiful. But today, um, I'm going to I'm going to focus on Morro Strand State Beach um, and talk about our big dune restoration project that we had at that park. Um, Morro Strand State Beach is this long, narrow strip um, that basically is bordered on the west side by the Pacific Ocean and on the east side by Highway One and the development. Right, so on the lower part here. Um, is the high school, we have the cloisters development, we have um, beachcomber house track, and then we have our campground. So um, it's a long narrow strip, which has its advantages and disadvantages. And I'll kind of mention it throughout my talk here. The total area is about, is about 200 acres. Um, and like I said, it, it has those boundaries, which are good and bad. So in terms of the history of the area, you know, some people might not realize, but back, back in the day, it was used as a World War II training area. And at that time, you know, this whole stretch of beach was, it was just kind of flat. It was just like a flat sand sheet, um, you know, no hummocky dunes. People used to drive out there because it, it's really compact sand. Um, and so it was pretty much, devoid of a lot of the vegetation that you see out there today. Um, then kind of came that development phase, which also came uh, when they want to kind of develop up to the beach, like many of the places in California, you know, they were scared that the sand was going to blow in. So they did a big, a lot of stabilization of sand throughout California and Laurel Strand is one of those places. Let's plant ice plant and beach grass to stabilize that sand to protect the buildings that we're going to put there. So that kind of started that era of sand stabilization and development. You know, we developed um, the housing tracks, the high school, we put in the campground, and now um, much of the beaches is, uh, is used by recreation, recreationalists, you know, transversing from that east side over to the coast. So our story kind of starts in 2007 
when basically we decided that we wanted to restore Morrow Strand. And you might ask, well, why there? Why did we choose there? And you know, if you look at you know that mission statement of um, of the natural resources, it's it's about protecting those unique representative habitats of California. And coastal dunes is incredibly unique, especially in California, as we've developed out as a state, there's less and less dunes available for people to enjoy and understand how that system works. So it's very unique. You know, coastal dunes, that four dunes, is the most dynamic habitat on earth, basically, because it's changing every day. Um, and so we really felt that that's a unique habitat we wanted to protect and restore. Uh, it was threatened by non-native species, the beach grass and ice plant. We have endangered species out there, um, most notably the, the snowy plover here um, that uses the beach. We also have Moro shoulder brand snail. Um, we have rare plants as well. We also, uh, that narrow band of that park that I was saying, has its advantages in the sense that it made the project very doable. It was very defined by the boundaries. It was accessible for us, and we really felt that we could accomplish it. And so that's why we chose Moro Strand to embark on this dune restoration project. And basically our objective was to remove um, or eliminate, if you will, um, European beach grass and ice plant, which were the main non-natives on that site. And by doing that, the hope was to increase the native species and improve the ecosystem services for humans and for wildlife. So basically increase biodiversity. So that was, that was our objective of this project. Um, you know, I, I think of, sometimes I think of our work as stories. And so for this restoration story, you know, the key players, if you will, the non-native plants are this, this European beach grass and this ice plant were the main dominant non-native species. We have many other non-native species, but they didn't like create that monoculture, if you will. Um, so ice plant and beach grass were really our main non-native plant focuses. And in terms of native species, uh, we have um, beautiful dune uh, specialists, I guess, if you will, um, our primrose, our beech burr, um, our uh, California aster, all the sand verbena, wallflower, all of these were the native species that we wanted to increase by getting rid of the non-native plants. So this is an example of that monoculture of what I'm talking about. So over here on the left side, this is all beach grass. There are no other species happening in here. Um, and that's, oops, oops, let's go back. Um, and here is the, and here are patches of ice plant with the beach grass on the border. So that's just an example of how these plants can take over and outcompete those native species. So in 2007, we decided to embark on this project. A lot of it was just mapping the current um, populations of the non-native plants and, and our natives as well. Um, but that kind of started us on understanding what we had to accomplish. How did we do it? A lot, a lot of hours, <laughs> a lot of hours by staff, by volunteers, by contractors. You know, we, we mapped our, we mapped the plants. We um, use contractors and staff to spray. Uh, we did use herbicide to spray the beach grass and ice plant. Uh, we removed the thatch from the area. We collected seed, we um, grew the plants and planted the plants. So, it was a multi-faceted multi restoration project for sure. And, you know, it takes, it takes a lot of hands, you know, many hands make light work, but, you know, we had volunteers at all aspects of this project, you know, um, after we collected the seed and, and grew it in our greenhouse, we used them to transplant them into, into pots. We used them to plant the plants out in the field. And, you know, we, we learned a lot as, as we, as we embarked on this project, we learned that we can't propagate every species. Like sand verbena, which is one of our favorite four dune plants, does not do well in a greenhouse, right? But we didn't know that until we until we learned and we tried to collect different different species. We finally learned that uh, just what we call the restoration palette, just a palette of tried and true 
seeds that we knew would propagate well and would outplant well would um, that we learned throughout the process. We learned that you can't just kill this beach grass like by spraying it with herbicide, it does kill the plant. But what happens is it gets these big, dense layers of thatch. And being a grass, it's got that silica in it and it doesn't break down. And so we learned that we had to clear it from the sand, you know, take these big patches of, of uh, dead beach grass and open up the sand so that those native seeds that are beneath it could have that heat in the sun to germinate. So these were all lessons we learned as we, <laughs> as we went on. And there was definitely challenges for sure. You know, um, I think one of the, the biggest challenges is, is the long-term commitment that it really takes. You know, this is not something um, that you can do in a day, you know, in a, in a year even. You know, you can do parts of it, but it is that sustained effort over time to, to make it successful. So that's one of the biggest challenges is having that long-term commitment. That uh, the narrow... Uh, ness of this park and that the fact that we have like eight access corridors good getting like people from the development to the beach all those corridors are vector areas for weeds to come in so weeds are constantly coming into this park and they're never gone so that's another challenge um our homes are that also border our park here uh you know many of these homeowners didn't want the ice plant gone from from their backyard, basically. And so we worked with them to create a buffer, if you will, um, so that they could have a little bit of a buffer of ice plant and our restoration project would come up to that buffer. So these were things over the years of the restoration project we learned um, and we were, we were able to overcome many of those challenges. In terms of successes, you know, we now can say that we basically converted you know, over 30 acres of land from a non-native dominated landscape to a functioning dune system. And that's pretty exciting to say, you know, we have for sure increased the ecosystem function of the site, increased the species diversity, and um, really cut down because we have vegetated so much of the, so much of the natives have come back, less trampling um, of people just walking throughout the park. Um, just by having the plants there and um, allowing people, kind of guiding them, if you will, with the plants. So the next uh, few slides are just some before and after, so you can kind of get a flavor of what was there and, um, and what it looked like. We don't have any recent photos here, but it does show you the, the before and afters. So we, we've seen this picture here on the left before, which is all that beach grass. And then here, these are all native plants coming in. Again, removing that competition and that monoculture has allowed these native species to thrive. And we only planted in particular areas. So this was a site, this is right by our kiosk as you come into Morro Strand. It was once all ice plant. And here we worked with our maintenance staff. They were really concerned. They thought, you know, if you take off that ice plant, all that sand is going to come into the road. And we said, well, Let's try to restore it with native plants and see if native plants can hold the soil as well as ice plant. And so uh, we removed the ice plant, put in the native plant. So this was an area that we heavily planted. And then you can see all the native plants here. And you can see in this last photo how it's holding that sand and doing just as good of a job of stabilizing that sand as that ice plant. This is um, at Highway 41 corridor, walking out to the beach. Again, um, all this kind of brown is European beach grass. And then you can see here, this is the white is yarrow. That's all native plants now. Super exciting. I love these photos. <laughs> uh, this is up in the campground. So we only planted areas that were more impacted. And that would be like by our campground or very visible. So by our campground, um, this is by one of our restrooms, again, showing just like a hillside of ice plant, the ice plant dying, the native plants coming back, 
and here they're just growing up. And if we took a picture out there today, it would be even more densely populated with native plants. There was a couple stories that we, uh, or a couple outcomes that we were not expecting. And I do like to tell this story because um, Blockman's leafy daisy is a rare plant. It's on the CNPS list. Um, it's not, not threatened or endangered, but it is a rare plant. And when we first started this project, it was, we only counted about five individual plants. And if you were to go out there today and walk that same, walk this whole area of the strand, I would say it is in the top seven plants of dominance out there. And that was not even one of our objectives. So here again, by removing those non-native plants, that competition that it had on that site and allowing these native space, they were able to basically restore on their own. We did try to propagate this in our greenhouse and we couldn't propagate it. It did, it did not do well in the greenhouse. So all of that growth and uh, expansion of that population was because of seeds that were already in the soil, but just needed a chance to thrive. So that's a huge success. Um, and one that, that wasn't necessarily our objective, which was exciting. This is the last slide. And this was actually what my coworker gave it to me and found it, I don't know, on social media or something. Someone took it with a drone, but it just makes me so happy. If we think back in the World War II days, this was one flat dune sheet, basically from the ocean, you know, to the left of this photo all the way, you know, all the way out. But now going back to our mission of state parks, this is exactly, exactly what we were looking for to show Californians and people that visit our state. This is a functioning dune system. You have your sandy beach, you have your active four dunes. These are our four dunes that are constantly moving, constantly in motion. Um, you have our back dunes, which are more vegetated now, thanks to uh, you know, thanks to removing the beach grass. And then just out of this photo, we have dune swale, you know, which is a wetland area that holds water pretty much a lot of time. I mean, most of the year when we have rain. Um, so this this basically this this gradient of dune is quintessential example of dune, coastal dunes in California. So it just made me really happy. It's what I like to end on. Um, and so, you know, we, we now just maintain the site. We go through the site a couple times a year because we do have to go through and, and get other weeds um, or re-sprouts of those. But basically this project has been converted and, um, and we're proud to share it. So that's it for my portion. I think Monica will open it up for a couple of questions and then Kelly and Molly will take us to Montana de Oro. Perfect, yes, I see three questions that came in. I think we'll um, ask the first two and the last question I think would probably be better for the end. Okay. Um, so we have one question uh, that came up while you were discussing the beach grass. How and where did you dispose of the non-native species that were removed? That's a great, great question. Uh, there's so many different restoration projects and, and many people take different, uh, uh, different approaches. So in this case, we kept all the non-native plants on site. So when we sprayed the ice plant, we let it decompose in site. Ice plant decomposes very fast and the natives can, um, can come through it. The beach grass, we basically made piles. We thought, we thought about burning it. We thought about burying it because um, this is what other people do throughout the state. In our case, we were able to just pile it and create these pockets of native diversity. And over time, those piles have decomposed. So um, all of that was left on site. Awesome, thank you. Um, and then the other question that I will answer for this part, and I see a couple more that just came through, but I think um, those can probably be for the end. Um, does the beach grass persist nearby such that active monitoring and removal will need to continue? Oh, great, great, great question. Yes, so um, we, like I said, we do go through the site two times a year, basically all our staff, and we will find 
um, Kelly and Molly can agree or not, um, you know, a few plants here or there. So it does take constant maintenance, but it really is only a couple times a year. So it's not, um, it, we're fortunate in the sense when I talked about the doability of the project, this particular species, because it's a perennial, doesn't really seed. It's not like bellgrass. It's not like mustard. It's not like these annuals that pump out a lot of seed. So again, we assess that in uh, before we embarked on the project in the sense of our success. Perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I see the other questions. I love them. I'll, I wanna make sure that Molly and Kelly get the chance to share their portion, then we'll answer those. I just wanted to share one comment that came through that says, I'm enjoying this program so much because I live in North Morro Bay and love seeing the changes going on in Morro Strand Dunes. Thank you for your efforts. Yay. <laughs> Perfect. All right. I will pass it on to uh, Molly and Kelly. Those of you who have questions remaining, uh, stay tuned. All right. I think. Oh, start it over. Hold on. Started. There we go. There we go. Okay. Hi, everybody. <laughs> uh, so yes, we, Molly and I are going to be talking about Montana de Oro State Park, and we're going to be talking about the restoration and protection efforts that we do out there to protect the coastal bluff scrub habitat. Um, I will give a little bit of a background why we restore this habitat, how we accomplish that, and then Molly will talk a little bit about the challenges and the successes that we face. So here's a little location map of Montana de Oro State Park. There's a little over 8,000 acres, uh, one of the larger uh, state parks here in California. And right here, over here on your right is the project site specifically that we'll be talking about. Uh, highlighted in yellow is the Bluff Trail, um, which runs the whole course of our restoration. Uh, we work more on the uh, west side of that trail along the bluffs. All right, and I'll give you some background, some history, just like Morro Strand State Beach. Uh, we do have history of the World War II training grounds out here for D-Day, um, you know, kind of give them an idea of what they would be facing when they stormed the beaches of Normandy. And then after that, for many years, it was a farmstead. Uh, out here, they grew lots of uh, crops like hay, grains, beans, et cetera, um, for livestock more so. And then eventually it became a state park in 1965. Uh, there are some consequences that come with farming and ranching. Um, two being topsoil disturbance and then compaction. The topsoil disturbance, one of those consequences is that it destroys the natural soil structure. And then it increases the susceptibility to water and wind erosion, which is one thing that we still face today as plants are being trampled. Um, and then compaction, with compaction comes a greater surface area that is exposed to sunlight and air, and then that therefore reduces um, the soil's ability to retain moisture. Well, it looks like I'm having a lag on my computer. <laughs> Here is some images back in the day in 1965 when we inherited the park of the farmed terrace to kind of give you an idea of what it looked like before our efforts started. And then now if you go out there and visit the park yourself, you could see a tremendous difference. Our story really begins in uh, 2013. Uh, it's when our restoration efforts really began there on the bluff side. Um, with bluff erosion uh, came a lot of safety concerns because the bluff was starting you know, to fall in. Um, and so we moved it back and we made it ADA compliant. So it's about 10 to 12 feet wide. Um, the trail runs about uh, 2.4 miles. Uh, it's kind of one just straight line and then you'd have to loop all the way back uh, making it almost close to five miles in loop. Um, and then with after the construction, that's what kind of came in with our revegetation of those native species. Yep. 
There we go. Okay. Sorry for the lag, guys. I apologize. Um, so why do we restore the coastal bluff scrub? Um, it is a very popular trail. Um, we're getting an increase of visitors, especially with the pandemic ever since. Um, and so we get a little over a million visitors a year. Uh, and it's very accessible for volunteers. So it allows us to, uh, you know, have work days and, you know, it allows us to bring out trucks of tools and materials and things like that, that we would need to conduct a work day effectively and safely and so on. In addition, why do we restore these uh, coastal bluffs? Uh, we have non-native species that are, uh, you know, dominating native species uh, such as New Zealand spinach. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about some of the common non-native species that we fight out here. Um, but one, the most prominent one being New Zealand species. As you can see, uh, I actually added this photo in that I took this week, um, but you can see these baby spinach coming in right here. And then we have this native uh, lizard tail. Uh, and eventually spinach will just become this one big patch if we don't maintain it and we just allow it to grow. Um, and then also as we increase visitors, we get an increase in user, what we call user created trails. So right here is the main trail, the ADA compliant trail. And then this is a trail that people have made out as they've trampled onto the native uh, plants. Uh, people tend to like to look out wherever they please. Uh, we do have lots of lookout points um, and so this causes us to have to fence off and brush in these trails. Uh, another reason is as people create these user created trails and they trample over the plants, uh, these areas will become just completely demolished and denuded of any vegetation. And then that therefore kind of creates the cycle all over again of accelerating erosion and runoff. There we go. Okay, so here's, I'm gonna talk about some non-native plants that we treat and control out at Montana de Oro. New Zealand spinach, which I've already mentioned. Um, another one is the two types of mustard that we commonly see out there, black mustard and common mustard. Uh, in addition, we do find wild radish, bull thistle and Italian thistle. Um, but for right now, uh, it's usually just New Zealand spinach, especially, and then the mustards that we fight. Some of the native plants that we grow and plant back out here and that you can actually find that pop up on their own, sawtooth golden bush, lizard tail, and then um, sea cliff buckwheat. Uh, we also grow and plant loco weed, fiddle neck, California sagebrush, and California poppy. Um, just some of the ones that we try to continue to plant out there. Now, how do we accomplish these efforts? Um, Staff. Staff is a huge part. We don't hire contractors out in Montana de Oro. Um, so it's many hours of hard work by um, us staff members. We spray. We have to spray because there's just so much out there. Um, don't have enough hands. We don't have enough time. Um, but we do try to hand pull, especially on our own and with volunteers, um, pull those non-natives. Uh, also, it takes up ripping up old compacted user-created trails and some areas where uh, some of the old trails still existed. Uh, last year in this photo right here, there was an old trail. And so we're kind of like pickaxe and at it, try to, you know, fluff it up a bit to disguise it and then uh, brush it in and hopefully plant more plants, spread some seed um, just to fill in those areas and then also fenced it off. Um, and so far right now, if you go out there, you can't even see it. It's very disguised. These are just some images, um, just like the last one on the last slide to show you us kind of showing you how we brush it in um, with some dead vegetation. Uh, and in turn, this helps protect the native habitat and just aims to eliminate those unwanted trails. Also staff here, we collect the native seed straight from Montana de Oro. Um, from the plots that we want to plant them back in. 
So we collect the seed, we grow them in our local greenhouse here in Morro Bay. And then once they're established enough, uh, we go back out into Montana de Oro and plant them on those user created trails, all those plots where we feel that they could, you know, use more native plants because the more native plants that we have, we hope that once we get enough of those species, they can outcompete the invasives on their own and we won't have to maintain um, the plots as much. Um, so we're just helping them along. Hopefully they can succeed on their own. And in addition to staff, volunteers. Um, some images here are from, from the, uh, some of the first efforts out on the bluff trail. Uh, first, we had to remove all of that biomass of the invasive weeds like New Zealand spinach and mustard um, and really get all of those out of the way. And then that's when we could come in and plant with native species. Uh, they were able to fill four 20 yard dumpsters, which is huge. Just thinking about that, that's a lot of biomass of weeds. Uh, and then Earth Day is a huge event. Um, that we have or had every year until the pandemic. And we're actually gonna resume that this year, which is super exciting. Um, and that's often funded by the Park Foundation in partnership with the pg &E. And so far for the Bluff Trail, we have up to 3000 volunteer hours. Um, and if you go out there now, you can really see where the effort's gone in back from, I mean, just those farm terrace to what it looks like now. Um, so it definitely takes a village, it does. And then I'm gonna leave it to Molly to talk about challenges and successes and um, also some, a little bit about what else we do here at parks and park programs. Slide right in here. <laughs> Hello everybody, I'm Molly. Um, <clears throat> so taking this talk now to uh, discussing the challenges and learnings that we've faced uh, while working on the Bluff Trail at Montana de Oro. Um, as you can see here on the bullet points, we have listed, uh, and Kelly and Jody have talked about how we've had a huge increase in visitors to our park, which is great. Everybody's getting outside, uh, enjoying their public spaces, uh, but that does present us with some new issues that we have to learn how to manage. Um, you know, with more people comes a lot more of those user-created trails that we've discussed, and uh, issues with those lead to trampled vegetation and compacted soil and uh, really limits the native plant growth and their health. So uh, on top of that, we just have to keep on top of those weeds. Uh, you know, you can't pull a weed and be done with it. They have uh, seasonality, they lay their seeds and those are now part of the seed bank and we have to continue to deal with that go back year after year to try and get those uh, freshly sprouting weeds. And, um, and we manage those in a number of different ways, whether that's through hand pulling or through chemical usage, um, but it all takes time and planning um, and a lot of attention. So uh, with that, we also have to deal with, um, you know, the intricate details of, uh, intertwine native and non-native plants. You know, they, it's not as simple as the natives grow here and the non-natives grow somewhere else. You know, sometimes they're growing right up in each other. And then we have to really, you know, decide how to manage that if it's um, worth, you know, applying uh, chemicals and potentially uh, losing a few natives so that, you know, we could take more strides forward in the future with uh, planting more native, plants and laying out more seed. And uh, yeah, it's really about figuring out what formula works best. Um, but in the photos that you can see here, uh, this is along the bluff trail. And we've got um, you know a nicely vegetated area with some symbolic fencing on the left side here. So that keeps out park visitors, leaves the, that space just for the plants. Um, the photo in the middle there shows that uh, our park is is visited, uh, you know, by a lot of visitors uh, each year. There's we have to make space for the people to enjoy the trails as well as the plants and the animals. And then on the far right, I have a photo of a user created trail with the symbolic fencing that has uh, been damaged somehow, and so it looks like an open invitation for people to walk out. However, that is uh, high on the list of spots that we need to restore. 
So on to the next side, slide here. Um, here's a picture of uh, native and non-native plants intertwined. So in the red circle there, if you can see, this is why I always say that uh, I spy is a great training <laughs> for, uh, you know, those books are great to train your eye to try to find the uh, invasive plants in with the natives. So we have New Zealand spinach growing here along um, with some, I believe that's Hazardia and some Dudlia there. And it is crazy how it can camouflage itself and just be on that same palette of green as uh, all the other plants that are native to the bluff trail there. So it really takes a trained eye, um, a lot of time and patience. On to the next slide here. Um, so part of the challenges here um, and learnings are what we do to restore this area and the user created trails. We'll sow seed that we spend time collecting out on the bluff trail. And then we wait for the right season until we get rain to start to sow that seed back um, into those spots that have been heavily trampled. And, uh, you know, it takes managing our time right, it takes uh, a crew of people, it takes elbow grease and the right tools. Um, and, you know, figuring out how to align that sowing of seed with the seasons and the rain. And um, this year has been a little interesting because we haven't had a lot of rain and that's something that we're learning to, uh, to deal with over time. And uh, so, you know, we just have to keep on, <laughs> keep on these projects, take our notes and be diligent about uh, sticking to our management plans. And so sometimes that takes revisiting sites, um, watering plants that we put in the ground. We try not to do that, but seeing as there's not a lot of rainfall, you know, we, we kind of uh, decide how we're going to help these plants along. So on to the next slide here. Another one of the challenges here, which is kind of a fun and exciting challenge is, uh, I hope you all can see the rattlesnakes that I have in my slides here or in these photos. Um, uh, you know, it's I've encountered as many as six rattlesnakes in a day out on the bluff trail. And, um, you know, luckily they're all pretty docile and uh, have, a pretty mellow temperament. Um, however, there was one day when we were out collecting seed and Kelly dove right into a bush and then jumped back about five feet after <laughs> setting off a rattlesnake. You know, no one was hurt, but uh, the rattlesnake was quite alarmed that we were up in their space. Um, but we always have to be on the lookout for them because, you know, it's great to see their presence. We're restoring their habitat and there's been an increase of rattlesnakes in recent years along the bluff trail. So that's great news we're doing it for them you know they're supposed to be there um the there's one photo in the middle where a uh, rattlesnake is kind of burrowed in its hole there and that plant that is growing over that that hole is uh new zealand spinach and that actually was a uh, a very close call where we went in to try to remove that plant and then saw that rattlesnake last minute. So, you know, we got to be on our toes. Um, they're hiding everywhere when it's warm outside. Um, that first photo on the left, actually, there's a rattlesnake that's in the grass. It was about a foot and a half to two feet uh, high off the ground. And it was just like one of the funniest uh, occurrences that I've had or um, run-ins with a rattlesnake. It was right off the trail. People were walking by it. So keep your eyes peeled. They're out there. Um, they won't chase you down. They don't jump. Just uh, it's exciting to see them. So we're happy they're there. On to the next slide here. One, two. Push that again. Oh, there we go. Okay, so uh, moving on to our successes here. Um, as you can see in this photo, this is a picture of the Bluff Trail. It's nicely vegetated with a lot of native species um, that have grown from seed, some that we've helped along by planting and sowing seed, um, but it's nice and filled in at this point. And um, just to kind of sum it up, we've uh, at this point, we've removed hundreds of cubic yards of New Zealand spinach from the Bluff Trail. Spots that were completely overgrown um, are now seeing a lot more uh, native plants in, in those plots. And, um, you know, there's it's all vegetated again. I don't know if you can remember the slide that Kelly showed about the farm terrace. It's just amazing to think of 
uh, what this space looked like before state parks came in and helped to, you know, revegetate this area with natives. Um, so in some spots along the bluff trail, we have symbolic fencing still apparent just to keep uh, the folks onto the main trail to reduce the trampling of vegetation that are in those plots alongside the bluff. Um, and in many of those spaces, we've been able to remove the symbolic fencing because the plants have grown so big and they make a fence of their own. <laughs> so, uh, so that's great news. Um, and we've touched on this a little bit, but it is, uh, great that you know as state parks we are here for for you and we are here for the species as well and uh so you know it takes some cohabitation and coexistence uh you know scheming to make that work we need spots for you all to go out to the bluff's edge and take in the views and enjoy that space and your solitude in nature but we also need to reserve some of those spaces for uh sensitive species like nesting birds that uh need their privacy to be comfortable to keep on their production of eggs and uh you know we just yeah so we have to have a little bit for everyone here the birds and the the native species as well as for the humans that come to enjoy our parks um and now if you walk along the bluff trail it really is a great showcasing of just the california coastal scrub here that um you know that that we represent so so uh as we touched on this we grow a lot of these plants in our local greenhouse in morro bay that comes with its own set of challenges from collecting the seed being on top of the plants when it is their season to produce these seeds uh making sure that we have it fit in our schedules to go and collect and to save them appropriately, to uh, sow them on time, working with the seasons, making sure we have enough uh, soil and nutrients and, you know, our soil has the, the right uh, you know, nutrients available for these plants. We ran into a couple issues this year, but we're working it out. We've uh, been able to grow a lot of plants that we've gotten in the ground so far this uh, planting season. So, so that's great. But you know, it all takes planning and time, and uh, we have to stick with it. And from the greenhouse to the truck bed to the bluff trail and in the ground, you know, it's uh, that's what we do here, and it's 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 a lot of fun. It's really rewarding to see them go in the ground. So here we have a few before and after photos of the Bluff Trail um, in years past. And you can see how sparse it was on the left to now it's got that vegetation. And this was last year, there's even more growing uh, now. So if you're, I highly recommend you go out there and just, you know, look in awe at all the, <laughs> the wonderful native plants that are thriving out there. Another one, this is really great, right along this first portion of the bluff trail. Um, you can just see how how many plants have come back and uh, revegetated that space. They're thriving there. Don't want to click that too many times. Let's see. Sorry, there's a little lag on this clicker. Oh, there, sorry, everyone, <laughs> there we go. Okay, one last before and after here just really shows, it's great when everything's flowering here. I love this photo, <laughs> really stark difference. Okay, and so uh, there we go. The last one here, it shows a user-created trail. Um, now revegetated and grown in. So that is great. Plants will grow where you plant them. There we are. <laughs> okay. Okay. So uh, with all that said, uh, habitat restoration is only one piece of the puzzle that we deal with here at State Parks. Um, and I just want to talk about our mission statement, which Jody uh, 
brought up at the beginning of this presentation. And so the state parks mission statement is to provide for the health, inspiration, and education of the people of California by helping to preserve the state's extraordinary biological diversity, protecting its most valued natural and cultural resources, and creating opportunity for high quality outdoor recreation. So that is a loaded mission statement there. We've got a lot of things that we deal with here, um, dealing from wildlife protection to how to manage visitors and provide for them, how to create healthy and safe parklands um, with enough recreation options available. Uh, we have education and outreach programs, uh, which are so much fun to work with the visitors and use this space as a classroom. Um, and on top of all that, just all the land management that goes into taking care of these spaces and how to do it uh, right and in the best way that we possibly can. And so with that, um, part of this puzzle is, are the uh, species that that thrive here and that live here. And um, there are some sensitive species, species of concern that we have to take extra precautions for and um, just work with here. I know we've got the snowy plover there, an elephant seal, we've got uh, kangaroo rats, um, black oyster catchers, uh, California horned lizard, Moro shoulder band snail. There's a red-legged frog and then that Blockman's uh, leafy daisy as well. And uh, we have a few programs. Uh, well, we have a snowy plover monitoring program and that has been in place for a number of years now where um, there are monitors that go out every day and uh, they record the um, successes of snowy plovers nesting sites and they take notes on predators and the successes and failures of those um, of those nests and uh, just take down all sorts of data that are very important into um, moving forward with our practices of managing this area. Um, and we have other monitoring uh, projects that go on like the uh, for the black oyster catchers. Uh, we've monitored them in past years. They're a species of concern um, that are an indicator of uh, the health of our intertidal zones. They, they uh, exist along the shoreline there. That's where they nest. That's where they live and feed and hang out. And so, um, you know, making sure that uh, that they're able to do that in a healthy way and just kind of keeping keeping notes on uh, the successes and failures of, of all of their efforts. <laughs> That's what we do here at State Parks. And let's see. So a few more slides just talking about those programs. Um, the black oyster catchers, uh, if it wasn't clear, is that blackbird with the orange bill and those pretty orange eyes uh, at the top of my screen. And they're here year long, um, and you'll see them all along the coast. They've got a really distinctive call, which is fun. You can hear them. You know, now I'll never unhear. <laughs> I'll never forget what they they sound like because it's uh, such a distinctive call. It's really cool, um, and. Yeah, well, uh, that's Kelly down there looking through the scope. We're monitoring uh, nests of the black oyster catchers out along the coast of San Simeon. Um, snowy plovers, of course, so tiny and cute. And then here in the bottom right of the screen, we have um, uh, a picture of our map station, a banding station. And MAPS uh, stands for Monitoring Avian Productivity and Survivorship. And it's actually um, a continent-wide collaborative uh, program that is spanned between uh, public agencies and non-governmental groups and um, individuals that uh, add da data to this, um, this program going on. And um, they collect in the in the maps program. They collect information on the age, the sex, um, the body condition, reproductive status of, of these birds, and all of that data gets um, compiled and is uh, added to just a really great growing database of just information that we can use to make future decisions and uh, you know check the stats of of all kinds of avian species. And so. Now moving on to uh, 
I think I missed a slide. <laughs> Getting a sneak peek here. There we go. Okay, uh, we have forestry and fire as well. And that um, Kelly and I and Jody, we mainly work in the weeds and restoration program. We have a separate program that deals with forestry and fire. So I'm not the expert on this, but uh, I can show you some fun pictures of what goes on and, and tell you a little bit about the prescribed burns that we do in our park um, to reduce fuels and, um, and to look at the health of uh, the forests that are within our district as well. And, um, you know, with with these prescribed burns, these don't go on all year long, of course. There's a season for this. Um, the weather has to be right, inclement weather. We have to have uh, low winds and, um, you know, things have to line up just right and we have to be prepared enough to uh, to tackle these things. And I, when we have these, these fires here, I'll go on to the next slide to show you. This is really cool. This is pile burning at Montana de Oro. And so uh, when we have these fires um, happen at Montana de Oro or other places within the park, um, our forestry program is really good about uh, keeping people on the job and overnight keeping an eye on the fires, making sure that things don't go uh, get out of hand. And uh, we always have a presence there to make sure that, uh, you know, this is seen through uh, all the way to the end. And um, this is to reduce the fuels that uh, fuels being leaf litter and other uh, biomass that accumulate on the ground. And so you can see how much of it is just, just burning up right now. And it's to reduce the impact uh, if a wildfire were to roll through this neck of the woods, uh, it would hopefully not be as high intensity. Um, and uh, there are challenges that come along with this too. You know, like I mentioned, the weather has to be right. We have to have the right amount of people. We have to make sure that, um, you know, I don't know if many of you are thinking this, but uh, the monarch butterflies love eucalyptus trees and that's uh, what is burning right here in these photos. And we actually have to go out and make sure that monarchs are not present in the sites for burn days because they uh, react to the smoke from the piles. And so we go out and check on all levels to make sure that we are using our best management practices um, to make sure that things run smoothly and according to plan. Um, it's really beautiful. Look at that campfire right by the ocean there. <laughs> they have a great view. <laughs> All right, and so just an ending statement that uh, parks are here to protect and enhance representative habitat or yeah, habitats and the species that rely on them and for the people to enjoy for generations. So uh, go out there, get outside, enjoy the trails that we have in our parks. We uh, tend them for the, the species and for you. Um, yeah, it's go on and enjoy some trails. They're beautiful ones out there. <laughs> and uh, this is also, uh, I want to take this chance to invite you all to join us for Earth Day. Um, this is a really big volunteer day that we have uh, every year, except for uh, throughout the pandemic, we took a couple years off, but we are resuming that this year, and that'll happen on April 23rd. Um, and uh, if you would like to know more about that or get signed up to be on a volunteer list, I have added Jody Isaac's uh, email, and you can go ahead and just send her a brief email. And in time, as we uh, get on top of dealing with uh, the specifics, we will get you more information. So, yeah, thank you very much. I'm going to go ahead and close out here, bring this back to Monica, probably open it up for some questions. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was fantastic, Jody, Molly, and Kelly. So wonderful. I feel like everyone who visits our park should listen to this presentation. Um, it's just, it's so important and so fascinating. So thank you for all the work that you do. Um, we do have a handful of questions in here and um, before we start them, I just want to mention if any of our attendees need to close out of the window, um, the presentation has been recorded and there will be a way for you to watch it later. Um, it will be up on YouTube next week, but stick around for the questions because there are some fantastic ones in here. 
Um, you mentioned volunteering and we have a couple questions about that. Do you have any opportunities um, that are more like long-term as opposed to, um, I know you mentioned Earth Day, but what are some ways um, for folks who are interested in doing uh, restoration work to volunteer with you? Who wants to go? <laughs> yeah, do you want me to do that? Yeah, Jody, that's, that's a Jody question. Yeah, we are um, currently building that program. So we don't, we have some long-term volunteer um, programs right now. We have roving volunteers that do interpretive work in our parks. We have um, sea life stewards that do some kayaking, but in terms of long-term restoration volunteers, we don't have a current program. So um, that we're trying to work with our volunteer coordinator, our coordinator, who's Robin Chase, to try to develop something like that. But right now we don't have, we don't have a program right yet. So folks should definitely sign up for Earth Day just to get their foot in the door. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's one question in here. It says, is state parks engaged in any other biological restoration projects? But I think we got to mention a lot of those at the end there. Um, Sean, if you had any follow-up questions to that, feel free to add it in the chat for the Q&A. Um, Vicki from the Elfin Forest would like to know how deep did the ice plant mat go and how did you dig it up? I believe that was in reference to Morrow Strand. Right. Um, actually, it, not very deep. You know, I, I've definitely been in other areas where it's been really deep, but for us at Morrow Strand, it was not so bad. So, I mean, it would decay within that first year for sure. So we were fortunate there. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and I believe this one was also in reference to Morris Strand, but could be um, for both. Has there been any monitoring of animal populations since restoration? Not necessarily. I mean, I guess, you know, uh, Kelly and Molly mentioned the, the rattlesnake. So that is something, it's not an official monitoring program, um, but it is something that we kind of take note of when we're out there, but we don't have necessarily before and after of wildlife populations. Got it, thank you. Um, any success in using signage to discourage off-trail visitors? I know we did see some of those signs in your presentation, but <laughs> I'm sure it's hard to get everyone to follow the signs. Yeah, I would say yes and no. Um, you know, we do have signs posted. I would like to think that it helps deter people away. Uh, we do still find people though off-trail. Um, behind fences and um, so but I'd so I'd say yes but maybe the more signs the better but you're doing your best that's you are. for you're sure <laughs> um, and I believe you talked about this too but if you wanted to elaborate um, any more did the native plants require hand watering to help in establishing especially with this continuing drought uh, that is a good question. Uh, we, after we plant um, plant species, especially in Montana de Oro, um, everywhere else, I mean, even forestry with their pine trees and stuff like that, we do try to water for a while until they're, we feel that they're established enough to succeed on their own, um, but definitely with the drought. Um, right now, we've planted a little close to 400 plants on the bluff trail recently in the last month, and we've been having to hand water them. Uh, we try to get out there once a week uh, just because we haven't seen rain um in the recent few weeks so in with the high heat temperatures uh, we just don't want them to die right away thank you um are there any plans to tackle the narrow leaf ice plant that has taken over the edge of the estuary along the outer boardwalk at the state park marina that's a great question it has just increased and increased i mean just over yeah, the past 10 years, um, it is not currently a project. Um, it's a little trickier there because it's on the edge of the bay. Um, so it, 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 it's noted, but it's not, but there's no planned project for it right yet. Thank you. Um, are there fines if people are found in areas that they do not belong? Yes. I mean, if the area is signed closed, for example, we're just about to put up our snowy clover fence come the beginning of March, if they are in a closed area, yes, they can be cited. 
um, if you're in an area, if you're there right now, like let's say you're at Moro Strand and you can hike anywhere in the dunes, you don't have to stay on trail there. So only if it is signed closed, can you be sighted? Yes, thank you. Um, and this question came up, which is what I was going to ask you. Um, along the Bluff Trail, um, there are several different colored flags there. Do they represent different species or different years or phases of planting? <laughs> That's so funny. We've been getting that question a lot while we've been out there. Um, you know, now I wish that we had done one single color, um, but it kind of <laughs> gives people that, you know, uh, they want to ask, which is great. Uh, we just are resources. So it was just the colored flags that we have. So they don't signify or mean anything. Um, they're just kind of give us an idea. We didn't flag every plant that we planted, but it kind of gives us a range of how far our plants go out in certain areas. So when we go out to water them, we kind of know where to look. Uh, and so they don't mean anything, no. I went out to the Bluff Trail um, last weekend and I noticed the, the different colored flags out there. I was like, oh, I can't wait to ask them this during the presentation. <laughs> <It's a> great <laughs> question. Baby natives wait, yeah. waiting for water. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Um, so I'm glad someone else asked it for me because I would have probably would have forgotten. Um, it looks like we have one more question unless anyone has any they want to add. Um, which native plants would you recommend for home gardens locally to keep sandy slopes stable? Oh, it's a great question. Where are you located, I guess? In what part in San Luis? You can give him a few seconds to type in there, but... That is a good question. Um, while we wait for that uh, response, I just wanna give you some compliments that came through. Amazing results at Moro Strand, great, great job, fantastic presentation. The work you've done is so impressive and very inspiring. Thank you for all you do for our parks and animals. Yay. Yay. And it looks like um, Los Osos. Los Osos. Oh, okay. So we have a good like range or a good set of plants that you could plant. Um, come on, it's out there. Lupin, mm -hmm. um, loco weed, lizard tail, yeah, hazardia. Well, to help with sand, yeah, those would help. I don't know, Jody. What do you think? I'm trying to think what's out on the sand spit right now. Um, buckwheat. It's really, it's really just kind of the density of native plants you want to put there. They all stabilize the soil. And it depends if you want a, a higher plant or a more prostate, uh, you know, low growing, uh, low growing plant, but pretty much all of our natives will do it. It just is really about a density of planting. You know, once, once you get good cover, it holds the sand, you know, just one lupin plant's not going to do it. You know, you really need to, you really need to cover the area. Um, but, you know, usually, you know, things that people really like are ones that flower, so like our hazardia and our buckwheat, which are nice, low growing, they don't get too tall, and um, they provide a nice low and, and pretty flowers, and so that's, and we know they grow really well and fast, so th those would be my recommendations, lizard tail, hazardia, and buckwheat, that's kind of like the tried and true palette, it's hard, they just, they grow well, they grow fast. That would be my recommendation. Perfect, thank you. That was all that came through. It looks like you have a few more thank yous coming through. Um, awesome, thank you so much. I am so happy that you're able to present this today. And I just, I really appreciate, and I'm sure all, everyone really appreciates everything that you're doing out in our park. So thank you so, so much. Yay. Um, I just wanna say one more thing to our attendees. As you close out of this window, there'll be a little survey that pops up, super short, not required, but it helps us figure out what presentations you wanna hear about. And um, you can find ways to stay connected with us and these programs on there as well. But um, thank you, Jody, Kelly, and Molly for everything. And I hope you have a wonderful weekend and we'll see you all next time. All right, well, thank, thank, you. You. thank you for having us. Thank, thank you, you everyone attending. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. Bye.